If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. As I thought about the first chapel of the semester and that many of you have been relocating, I uh, talked with some of you yesterday about uh, uh, house hunting. It's the great time of our economy that in the tough times of the economy, there are also some blessings, which is uh, not the least of which is low interest rates. And so I recently refinanced my house and uh, dropped my payments from 30 years to 15 years and didn't change my monthly payment at all. And uh, that's a blessing in disguise. While the rest of the economy hurts, sometimes those are backdoor blessings. But I want to talk to you this morning on the topic of the appraisal of two houses. The appraisal of two houses. If you have your text in front of you, I've had a blast working on this passage in the last uh, number of days. And though I have taught in the Gospels and have taught through Matthew, uh, every time I come, uh, I see new insights, uh, new applications for my life. And I thought, as you'll see this morning, that it would be befitting to us who uh, spend our time studying uh, the Word of God together at Dallas Seminary uh, not to miss an important principle, which is the principle of application. Uh, This passage concludes with one of the seam passages in the literary structure of Matthew. Uh, There are five statements that come at the end of five discourses. Each begin with the phrase, kai egenita, and uh, it has reference to what Jesus has just said and what Jesus will say or demonstrate, and therefore it becomes a literary hinge. This one comes at the heels of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, The next one comes in uh, chapter 11, verse 1, following the discourse of the presentation of the kingdom to an exclusive Jewish audience, not to Gentiles. Uh, not to Samaritans, but just to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then in chapter 13, verse 53, he is concluded with a a, a 52-verse discourse on the parables and what uh, are the mysteries of the kingdom of God in the present age and what on earth is God doing for heaven's sake anyway uh, during this period of time between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. The fourth one finishes with that discourse to the church as Matthew anticipates in chapter 16 with the prediction of Jesus that he would build the church uh, in the future. Then in chapter 18, how do you function within the church, especially with erring brothers and sisters? And so he finishes in chapter 19 and turns the corner from that message then to some final instructions with his disciples on the way to uh, Jerusalem and ultimately to uh, Golgotha and the resurrection. At the end of the Great Olivet Discourse, chapter 26, 1, has the same uh, theme, the same transition phrase as he finishes that great discourse from the Mount of Olives about the future and what uh, will happen prior to the return of Jesus Christ. So we, we come to the end of that first section and read with me, follow along. Verse 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven. It takes a right response to the message of God and the will of the Father to enter the kingdom of heaven. So this is not professing Christendom. This is parallel with kingdom of God as you compare the Gospels. You can't get in the kingdom of heaven without a right response to the message and the will of the Father. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. I think this is one of the scariest passages in the scriptures. Of people who thought they were functioning in the authority of Christ, doing a magnificent ministry as it would be appraised by some. And Jesus says, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Lord, Lord, in profession, does not necessarily equal possession. Luke asks the question in his parallels uh, to this passage in Luke 6, 46 to 49, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do 
what I ask you to, what I tell you to do. Jesus demanded two things of his uh, followers. One, that they would listen. In other texts, he says, be careful how you listen. Uh, we need to give Jesus Christ a chance to be heard. And second, what they do. We need to give Christianity a chance to work. Ethics need to be translated into energy. Knowledge must become action. Theory must become practice. Theology must be turned into life. Matthew says, not everyone who says, Luke says, why do you call me Lord, Lord? I think the question that this passage asks and answers, what's the real danger of not applying the word of God to your life? Uh, this is a very familiar passage. I, I grew up, uh, the wise man built his house upon the rock. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. And then when my kids were little, they had the, uh, the, the uh, little tunes that, uh, I'm trying to think of the, the book, starts with an S, Salty series. And it was Salty Volume 2. My son, who's 21, told me that last night. We scoured the house. We found Salty 1. We found Salty 3. We couldn't find Salty 2 or you'd had it over the intercom this morning. And then Petra, a few years later, uh, did a, a theme song with regard to this passage. Uh, I'm going to tell you, those are three different styles of music. <laughs> but it is the same message. This comes as the concluding application to the Sermon on the Mount in which there has been appeal to both believers and unbelievers. He says to the believers, uh, Blessed are you when? Uh, blessed when you are persecuted for righteousness sake. He, he says you are the, the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. He, he assumes a right response when you pray. Pray to your heavenly Father this way. But there's other portions of the Sermon on the Mount that are addressed to the wider audience that stand, if I could say this, in the background of the disciples who are in the foreground when he says, enter by the narrow gate. And the warnings of the two kinds of trees and the two kinds of professions. And now we come to two kinds of buildings. So I, I take it that this conclusion can apply to a believer's life of hearing the word of God and doing the word of God, and it also can apply to an unbeliever's life who may have the potential to listen to Scripture but never respond to Scripture. So I think a dual audience is implied by the very context of the Sermon on the Mount. But what's the real danger of listening and not doing? Well, in Matthew's Gospel, listen to it with me. Therefore, verse 24, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Matthew has the term wise man, uh, an Andre uh, Franimo. Uh, he, uh, he, he mentions the wise. That would have a background in Jewish wisdom literature from the Old Testament times. Luke does not use the terms wise and foolish. He just describes the wise action and the foolish action. But the wise man is the one who hears the words of mine, he says, and simply does them. And I think he says, practice them. The construction, the storms, and the result serve as a, a broad outline of both the description of the narrative of the wise man and the description of the foolish man in his building. In the construction here of the wise man, Matthew says, he built his house upon the rock. Luke says he dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. In the land of Israel, the primary rock that uh, covers that land uh, is uh, limestone. Three different kinds. There's a real soft, there's a medium, and there's a hard. And uh, wisdom says, uh, build your house on rock. When we were building the 10-story building this past year over here, our apartment complex, was Tower, uh, we had to go down 73 feet to get to uh, blue limestone, 
on which we could uh, put the bell pillars to have a stable foundation for that 10-story building. Seven stories down to go 10 stories tall. Wisdom says, <laughs> go till you hit something hard. Go to the rock. Or, if you've got a little house, you can float it on a slab of mud. And that's a technology with a tension cabled uh, foundation that they use, and you just want to make sure you've got your uh, mud wet, or your house will crack, and so your house just sits there and floats on a bed of mud. I'd rather have pier and beam, but I happen to be on mud. <laughs> Sometimes wisdom has a price tag. <laughs> and limits what you'd like to do. But he, he, he dug down, he, he laid the foundation. Now notice the storms. Matthew says the rain came down, the, the streams arose. You remember, the, the, the rain came down and the floods came up. Great visual aid song for youth and children. We still remember it as adults. And the winds blew and beat against that house. Luke shortens this, the flood came and the torrent struck. It's, it's just a bad storm. He doesn't give us any more description than that. Here's the way it was built. Here's the kind of stress that it endures. What's the result? Matthew says, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Luke says that that storm, I love this, could not shake it because it had been well built. That's the wise man. The foolish man is described, André Moreau. We get our word moron. It's not a compliment by any means. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice, he is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Matthew says he built his house on the sand. Luke says he built his house upon the ground without a foundation. Luke, writing to a broader audience, may have generalized the term under the inspiration of the Spirit to communicate with a wider Gentile audience than uh, what the Jews would know about uh, that terrain in Israel in which you have uh, dry wadis, which are great to walk in in the summer unless they're filled with sand, but in the winter when the rains come, they, they turn into torrents. Uh, you won't live long here in Texas without seeing a difference if you come over the bridge of uh, the uh, levied uh, riverbed here in Dallas than when it really rains. Some of you don't know this. It's one of the attractive things some would say about Texas is it rains more here than it does in the state of Washington. May know not, may not know that. We just get it all in one day. And so rather than letting it drain off, we just, we just have the rain and then it floods in the Brazos River. And uh, if it hits here, it's going to flood Houston. So it's better to come to Dallas than to live in Houston. Be on the upper end of the water you know, uh, edge. But the, the point is, uh, when it's dry, it's no big deal. We in Colorado, growing up in the hills of Colorado, we used to have what we called gully washers. You'd have these dry gullies until it rained, and then, boy, they'd start flooding. And uh, I'll never forget the flood of the Thompson Creek Canyon that took the lives of a number of Campus Crusade for Christ workers who were at, uh, working in that uh, region around Fort Collins uh, back in the 70s. It doesn't appear to be dangerous until the stress comes. And then it becomes devastating. The storms are identical. Don't miss this. Matthew says the rain came down, the streams arose, the winds blew, it beat against the house. Luke says the moment the torrent struck the house, it's simple, the torrent struck the house, something happens. The results, Matthew says it fell with a great crash, mega lay, a mega mess. Luke says it collapsed and its destruction was complete, mega we use mega today for an adjective of, uh, or an adverb of uh, exaggeration. And uh, it was bad, just simple. The narrative is short, it's to the point, he's done. Except 
for a statement that we'll read in a moment. See, the foolish builder had underestimated the threat. The foolish builder overestimated his security. The greatest of all storms for those listening to this message who do not have Christ as Savior, who have not trusted in the word and the message of Jesus Christ, is an eschatological storm. It's an imagery of final judgment. And the Bible uses the imagery of, of uh, storm uh, throughout both the Old Testament and the New Testament, even through into the book of Revelation and through the book of Revelation. You don't want to be caught in the worst storm of all. But for the believer listening to this, it's not final eschatological implications, but it, it, it's temporal. And, and what happens in a person's life and what happens that uh, will affect how a person stands before the Lord for all eternity? When the storms of life come, the structures fool no one. Above all, they don't fool God. I want to step back for a moment, and as I look at this passage, I see five truths. Five truths, and maybe we could call them principles. And then I want to suggest an application for each. Number one, what I learned from both Matthew and Luke in the opening structure is that profession of lordship without obedience is a core inconsistency that needs immediate correction. It's a core inconsistency. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? It's a core inconsistency. It needs correction, therefore, fix it. Fix it. If you and I are going to call him Lord, a recognition of a position and authority that's inherent within that position especially Lord of Lords, then for us to say no, Lord, is the ultimate oxymoron. No, Lord is not something you and I could say. It's yes, sir. Right away, sir. Whatever you say, sir. Came off the Christmas holiday. I love Mary's response. Be it be it unto me according to thy word. That immediate obedience. If the claim of lordship and a lifestyle of disobedience is yours, what I learned from this passage is that Jesus would ask you to fix it. It's inconsistent. Number two, I noticed that the stress of life as illustrated by the storms, comes on both the wise and the foolish, the obedient and the disobedient. Uh, some of you have just moved to Dallas. My first six months in Dallas were horrendous. Uh, we we uh, drove into town in the first part of July, and they were building the wrong house on our lot. We had signed for a little starter home out in Arlington and signed up in April. They sent us a set of plans. It didn't look quite right. I wrote them back, said these don't look exactly like what we were looking at. Could you fix it? They said, sure. They didn't fix it. And we got into town, and the house that we had bought was different than the one they were building. We stayed over here in the West Stone Apartments for a couple of weeks. I was teaching a summer school class that summer, and we were sub-leasing from another couple. Uh, the water went down. The air conditioning went down. We loaded up to go stay with Dr. Ron Blue at his house. Uh, packed all of our stuff that we had with us. Everything about the house was in storage. And uh, we packed the car at 10 o'clock or 12 o'clock. We came out at 5 o'clock to drive out to Arlington early. And our car had been broken into. Uh, all of our stuff was stolen. And uh, what they didn't want was strewn down the alley. When we finally got the house reconfigured, they had scaffolding in it the first six months we were in it. Because the roof line went like this. And the bathroom tile started over here and ended up like this over here. And we finally had to put a tub in that looked like this just to have the tile work. <laughs> Getting approval for the loan, having the house appraised, having all of that was an emotional roller coaster that I never want to live through again. 
unless I couldn't learn the lessons we learned any other way. And I just want to let some of you know uh, the stress of life comes on the wise and the foolish, the obedient and the disobedient expect it. I had a, a great eureka, for lack of a better term. This past semester, uh, Thursday evening, I was at Texas Stadium with the uh, Billy Graham uh, mission to the Metroplex. And it was a great night of watching God move in the hearts and lives of people. I'd never seen that live before, and you just can't capture the feeling on television that you have when you see people sitting next to you pour out of their seats who are not the counselors but were going to make a decision to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. Nothing. Barbie and I sat and we wept. Friday night, we had to be out of town on behalf of the seminary, and the big deluge came. I mean, it was torrential, five inches in a day, in a few hours, huge rainstorms. And I, and I stood in the soaking wet in Love Field waiting for a Southwest Airline flight down to San Antonio. And I looked out and I said, God doesn't even stop the rain for Billy Graham. I mean, that was a huge comfort for me. I'm going to tell you, because I've prayed about weather for our barbecue. You know, Jim Thames uh, directs it. Uh, we prayed for good weather at, uh, you know, graduation. We prayed for this. And I'm not, you know, I, I'm not saying we shouldn't. But all of the prayer, all of the money, all of the invitations, 80,000 people on a Friday night to show up at Texas Stadium, you would think God would say, let's, let's not do this one. Let's keep it dry. He didn't. And I sort of felt good. Because if God doesn't answer my prayer to keep it dry, God doesn't answer Dr. Graham's prayer to keep it dry, I'm okay. It's okay. Whether you're wise or foolish, obedient or disobedient, the storms hit. Don't miss it. They were identical storms. Rain falls on the just and the unjust. Expect it. Number three, what may destroy others does not have to destroy you. For those who don't have the word of God foundational in their lives, and there are failures in marriage or failures in the ministry, and you who are heading into ministry will be counseling people uh, who have gone so far out of their way to mess their life up. Just because it happens to some doesn't mean it, happens, it has to happen to you. And there is a way to avoid a destroyed life. So resist it. Resist the destruction that comes because of a failure to apply God's word to your life. Number four. Wisdom is demonstrated by obedience to God's word. Wisdom is defined in this passage as hearing and doing. That's wise. The intersection of truth and obedience, chokmah, happens. Wisdom is developed. May I encourage all of us to take at least one step of conscious obedience every day. One more step of what I know to be true and I know to be right and make it a conscious decision to step forward. Do it. Just do it. Number five is an overarching theme, I think, of this passage. It's the application of God's word that brings stability in times of testing or judgment. It's the application of God's word brings stability in times of testing or judgment. And my application would be enjoy it. Don't take pride in it, but enjoy it. 
Enjoy watching God work his work in your lives. As is often the case with some of Jesus' statements, their expansion of Old Testament wisdom, there is a proverb in verse 25 of chapter 10 that says this, As the whirlwind passes, so is the wicked no more, but the righteous is an everlasting foundation. In this context, if the buildings are the same, assumably, and the storms are the same, the only thing that's different in the appraisal of these two homes is a rock foundation versus a sand foundation. I think in this context, the rock then, the foundation that brings stability in times of stress, suffering, testing, or judgment is the application of the Word of God to our lives. It's not to denigrate Christ. He's all over this. It's His Word we're listening to. The question is, either we do it or we don't do it. It's not the Word of Christ. Both have that in common. It's not access to Christ. Both have that in common. It's what one does with that opportunity is a different way of building one's life. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, as we head into a new semester, for those of us who study to teach and those of us who study to serve, those who study to minister, whether in the immediate or in the far view of their lives, would you help us not miss this truth? Help us not be hearers of the word only, but doers. James expanded this for us in great terminology and promised a unique blessing for the person who consistently stares into that perfect law of liberty and continues therein. That one will be blessed in whatever he does. We want your blessing in our lives but we want to get it your way. So I pray for this semester that you would transform all of our lives as we take new steps of obedience. And your spirit convicts, enables, empowers, and changes us. According to your word, we are grateful in your son's name.